This is uh, basically a talk um, that's also part uh, appeal. Um, PuzzleNet is basically a new creation of mine. Um, I saw a lot of things in the news and read a lot of stuff. Uh, I was on the uh, Freenet mailing list for a while. I got off that a while ago because I didn't really have time to read it all. Um, and it was difficult to follow. Um, uh, the guy that was up here last was talking about Freenet, and uh, he basically described that there's a lot of difficult problems involved in the way the Freenet system works on how to do searches and stuff. Um, so uh, I uh, observed all this stuff and uh, basically decided that I liked certain features of, uh, of Napster, Gnutella, uh, Freenet, um, some of the other ones like uh, Publius, which is fairly recent. And um, I basically decided that uh, there had to be a better way. <laughs> and uh, PuzzleNet is kind of my attempt. Um, so far, I haven't had a whole lot of feedback um, on the PuzzleNet concept. Um, it's fairly new. Um, I'm kind of outing it here. Um, you guys are supposed to be like the best programmers in the world, right? Um, so uh, I'd, I'd basically like uh, people to look into PuzzleNet, uh, read about it, uh, sign up for the mailing list, give me some feedback, tell me you know what you think uh, stinks about it, uh, whether or not you think it'll ever work, um, and maybe even contribute some code to the uh, to the effort. Um, so far, it's it's basically still in the design stage. Um, you know, Freenet has a major advantage in that Freenet is over a year old. Um, the, uh, Ian Clark wrote his paper. Um, uh, sometime last year, I think it was, and uh, the people that have been working on the Freenet project have been working on it for months and months. Uh, so they have a major advantage as far as how far they've gotten along. Um, but because of the difficulty of, of the protocol and the difficulty of the concept, um, they still aren't to a stage yet where you can you can really use it um, and do anything really useful with it. Uh, so uh, this is PuzzleNet. Um, let me see a show of hands. Uh, I'm going to do my demographic here like, like uh, the last guy. Um, how many of you have an internet connection at home? Um, okay, I think I saw one guy back there. Everybody say hello to Mr. Mitnick. Um, <clears throat> now let's see another show of hands for uh, people that have AOL at home. <laughs> okay, uh, that's that's encouraging that I saw very few hands because uh, basically uh, the idea for PuzzleNet um, was uh, spawned by the fact that I have a cable modem at home. Um, I have a permanent internet connection. I'm sure a lot of you are the same. Um, a dial-up connection just doesn't do it for you. Um, so. I kind of planned it around uh, people that have uh, a constant connection, that have a uh, decent upload bandwidth, like maybe 30 kilobytes a second, um, that have a good download bandwidth, uh, people that can download stuff really fast um, and don't really like to wait for things to download. Uh, so uh, let me just move on here. Uh, of course, we're sponsored by Microsoft. Um, uh, this is a little different than I'm used to. Uh, this was my last presentation that I did. Um, <laughs> this, this was at uh, Linux Fest in Kansas City, uh, if you heard about that. Um, so I'm a little bit more nervous up here than I was there. Uh, this, this was the, the main floor of Linux Fest uh, at the pretty much busiest time of the day. Um, so anyway, uh, an introduction to PuzzleNet, well, I've already kind of described a little bit of what it is. It's basically very similar to um, a lot of other things like Freenet and Gnutella, where uh, it's, it's basically intended to be an anonymous way uh, to share information, um, uh, a way to stand up for free speech. Um, it's a noble cause. Um, but it's also a way for people to distribute uh, large binary images, um, 
you know, the, the classic examples are uh, ISO images for CDs, uh, MP3s, uh, movie files, anything that's really big, you know. Uh, if I want to put uh, files on my web server at home uh, and somebody wants to download them, uh, that's great, but they only get the file at like 30k a second. And if there's two people downloading, they get it at like 15k a second. Uh, so, you know, that's what PuzzleNet is, but what it's good for, hopefully, uh, if it works right, is uh, to allow people to share really large files and people who are getting those files to get them fairly quickly. Um, if you're downloading a, an ISO image of, say, Rock Linux, uh, which I, uh, I'd like to promote, um, that ISO image is probably, you know, 500 meg, and you don't want to wait while you're downloading that for it to come through a, a 28.8 modem um, that's like a couple hops over on Freenet. Uh, you don't want to wait for that to come down from uh, a site that only has an upload capability of 30k a second. Uh, it would be really nice if um, you could download that file at a megasecond and it took you know, approximately an hour and a half to download. Um, an hour and a half is a long time, but it's a heck of a lot less time than six days. <laughs> um, so hopefully that's what PuzzleNet will be good for. Um, that's basically the, one of the design goals. Um, I actually had some notes that I meant to bring out, so I might do that now. Um, in the process of, of designing PuzzleNet, um, it's you know one of the design goals that I mentioned was anonymity, and when you're sharing information um, of a political nature, um, maybe of a copyrighted nature, um, you don't really want people to know who you are putting this stuff out there, and you don't really want people to know who you are downloading this stuff. So uh, one of the ways that you can try to obtain that goal is by using cryptography and cryptographic methods. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are into cryptography, familiar with it. Um, the, uh, the Bible for working on crypt cryptographic stuff is uh, Bruce Schneider's book, uh, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, wait a minute, wrong book. Uh, this is the book. Uh, this is the new edition. Uh, I don't know if he's planning on a third edition, but uh, maybe sometime. Uh, he's got a new book coming out um, that he was promoting yesterday, and uh, I hardly recommend his books. Um, sometimes they're a difficult read, but most of the time uh, they're really well written and they, they describe the stuff extremely well, and the information is really useful. Um, so essentially, uh, cryptography has a lot of capabilities. It also has a lot of limitations. Um, when you do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, um, as long as nobody intercepts your key exchange and replaces what you're exchanging with uh, something of their own choosing, then after that key exchange, you can use that key to encrypt the data that you're passing between uh, yourself and the other person. And you know, as long as the encryption is good, uh, which uh, Twofish or Rindall uh, are probably pretty good uh, if you're using at least 128-bit key, um, then you know nobody can tell what you're transferring. Uh, on the other hand, if you have that man in the middle who replaces the information that you're exchanging with something of their own choosing, uh, then whatever information you pass between you uh, is not very secure. And you don't necessarily know that. In fact, you probably don't know that. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of uh, um, pitfalls with cryptography and uh, um, just to reinforce some of the things that, that Bruce says in his talks, um, 
cryptography, the math behind cryptography is, is fine. Um, the weak part is how you use it. Um, so an anonymous network uh, doesn't sound all that difficult, but it is. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're hiding behind several hops, um, that's good. Uh, when you're using cryptography properly, that's good too. Um, when you use a combination of both, uh, that's probably better. Um, but there are a lot of things to keep in mind. There are a lot of difficulties. So uh, essentially, uh, I'm going through all this design work, uh, figuring out how to get things to work. Um, Things are still a little dynamic. Uh, I change my mind on things. Um, I decide something's not quite as good as it could be. Uh, I change something. Uh, so basically, I encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, read through the information on the web page. Um, I'll get to some web page links uh, a little later on. Um, and I'm looking for feedback on uh, you know whether you think there's a problem, whether you think this is good, uh, how you think this compares with, with other things, whether you're interested. Um, anyway, uh, I'll get on to uh, definition turns so I can start on the next slide. Um, by the way, uh, my presentation is a little bit last minute. I, I uh, was nearly killed by an uh, by, uh, office mate of mine uh, about a week ago, and so <laughs> I'm still on the a short road or maybe long road to recovery and uh, haven't had time to work on this stuff as much as I would like. Um, so the presentation is um, approximately three GIF files and one MP3. But um, anyway, defini defini bleh, definition of terms. Um, there aren't really that many terms, so hopefully you can remember them. Um, basically there's uh, Hopefully I can remember them. Um, basically there's puzzle pieces. Uh, and the reason for the name PuzzleNet may be obvious as soon as I start explaining it. Um, basically, in order to get fast down downloads, uh, if you have a limited upload capability as far as bandwidth is concerned, but you have a high bandwidth download capability, um, and there are other people like you, uh, maybe you can download things piecemeal from other sites and maybe get 30k a second from a thousand different sites, well, you know, that would give you like 30 meg a second, but uh, as long as you don't exceed your download bandwidth, um, if you download uh, from a thousand different places and you get 1k a second from each of those places, then you're effectively getting uh, 1 meg a second. So, uh, hopefully that's the way PuzzleNet can work. Um, Essentially, uh, the main term is a puzzle piece, and that's basically a piece of a file. Um, the, uh, the nominal size of a puzzle piece would be approximately 32K. Um, I basically was looking at uh, the average DSL or cable modem user has an upload capability of about 32K a second. So um, if you're downloading from somebody, uh, and you're downloading a 32K chunk, um, depending on what their usage is, uh, you might get it in half a second or, uh, you know, 10 seconds, a minute. Um, it shouldn't really matter too much if you're downloading from enough different people, enough different sites, then uh, even a 1K a second download uh, can still contribute to uh, a very high bandwidth download. Um, and it doesn't really tax uh, any one site, and it doesn't tax the network too much because um, the concept is to go more directly uh, for the downloads than, uh, say, Freenet, which um, when you request data through Freenet, you're basically going through the net and the data comes back to you. That means the data traverses the net. Um, with PuzzleNet, I wanted to make the downloads more direct. Um, in order to keep them anonymous, I ended up using uh, proxies for the transfers. 
Um, the encryption ensures uh, that the proxy has no idea what's being transferred, um, but uh, the data itself doesn't go through the network, and so the network traffic is reserved for passing packets around for searching, uh, for uh, inserting data, um, mainly for searching and, and the responses to searches, but uh, some of the other um, administrative stuff on the network. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I can't think of too many other terms at the moment, so maybe when I come upon them later in the talk, I'll remember to define them. Uh, and then, etc. Uh, let's say a typical user like me um, has a bunch of Grasshopper Takeover MP3 files that he wants to make available to uh, all of you Grasshopper Takeover lovers. Um, I already have a bunch of Grasshopper Takeover MP3s on my website, but uh, um, if you want to download them, you get them at you know 30k a second or 15k a second. Um, and if there are a lot of people downloading, you get them even slower. Uh, one of the nice things about a network like Freenet is uh, that the data stays on the network only as long as people are requesting it. And uh, there's a very similar um, way that PuzzleNet handles data. Um, the data doesn't actually traverse the network, so it doesn't get replicated through the network. Uh, but over the course of time, um, the way it's intended to work, when you download things, um, you're, you're requesting from somebody. And the person that's supplying that file is going to get a few requests, or no requests, or dozens of requests over the course of any given day. And at any given time, if a node uh, that's serving up files gets lots and lots of requests for a certain file, um, then they can basically uh, disperse copies of that file that they have uh, out among uh, more of the servers to spread the load. Uh, so I kind of like that feature of Freenet and I decided to, to try to emulate that with PuzzleNet. Uh, anyway, uh, I need to move on to the, uh, the slide, I guess. Um, the concept of searching basically is very similar to GNUtella. Um, when you send a search request out onto the network, it gets propagated out to all of the server's neighbors and all of their neighbors' neighbors and all of their neighbors' neighbors to a certain extent. And then you get responses back, um, basically uh, packets that you send out on the network have an ID and uh, everybody can route responses back based on that ID. Um, so uh, just like in GNUtella, when you do a search, your search is actually propagating out to uh, all the nodes within a certain number of hops of you, and you're getting responses back, and then uh, you can decide how to proceed from there. Uh, but because you're searching on so many different nodes, when you get uh, you know six or eight or ten hops out, uh, you're more likely to get uh, lots and lots of hits, and you're likely to find all the different puzzle pieces for this file that you need. Um, then basically you proceed to uh, selecting which files, which hits that you want to download, and once you've selected them, the download process can begin. The download process basically is you take all these responses from your searches that you've gotten back, and uh, you individually request the different puzzle pieces for that file. Um, all this is, is essentially uh, encrypted between you and uh, this other node that has the files. Um, and some of you may realize that that is a difficult proposition. Um, when you're talking an anonymous network and you're talking uh, you know, many hops out into the network, uh, I'm, as a client, talking to a server over here that's six hops away. Uh, how do I exchange a key with him such that nobody else can can tell what data is transferring between the two? Um, 
That is a major problem with, with any network. Um, if you don't know who you're talking to, then how do you know that they're who you're talking to? Um, well, it kind of, uh, it's kind of a paradoxical question because you can't really tell who you're talking to and you don't really know, so you don't really care. Um, but uh, because of the way the, um, the search responses come back, uh, there's essentially a time delay between two different parts of the search responses and uh, you need both responses in order to decrypt uh, the search result. So if you're looking at your search results that you're getting back um, and you see uh, some search results coming back uh, after a certain time period, you know they're invalid. If you see search results that come back um, that are too close together, you know they're invalid. Um, <clears throat> you can kind of follow that a little bit more precisely on the web pages. Um, I try to describe it a little bit on the web pages uh, and then describe the different packet types they're using and everything. Uh, I don't really want to get too deep into the details of it here, um, basically because uh, all of this is slightly dynamic and still changing a little bit, but uh, also because I have a flight to catch <laughs> right after the talk, and I kind of want to get through this so that you can maybe ask a few questions. Um, essentially, then, you're, you're taking these search responses and you're requesting pieces uh, from the search responses and downloading individual pieces to form this file. Um, once you get that file, how do you know that you've built the file correctly with, from all these pieces? Um, and how do you know uh, that the file is what you really wanted? Uh, the files essentially have uh, a set of metadata attached to each of the pieces, and uh, the metadata agrees between the different pieces, so that when you download from uh, five different people who have five different pieces, um, you can verify that the metadata agrees, and um, basically PuzzleNet uses um, the secure hash algorithm, and uh, uses that to verify the data that you've downloaded. If I download uh, the first puzzle piece and see that it has a certain hash value, and then I download the second puzzle piece, the second puzzle piece's metadata is actually going to include um, a secure hash value for other puzzle pieces, and I can verify that all those match. If, if I download puzzle piece one, and it has a secure hash value for puzzle piece two that doesn't match uh, the secure hash value that puzzle piece two has, um, then I know one of the two of those is bad. And if I can download puzzle piece one from three different sites, uh, then I can see whether uh, the first site gives me an, uh, um, a basically a puzzle piece that agrees with the third site, but it's different than the second sites. Um, and you can use that as kind of a voting scheme to say, you know, if two of these three servers are giving me this uh, puzzle piece that, that correctly validates itself uh, with the other puzzle pieces, then I'm going to go with that and not this other piece that seems to be coming from uh, an obnoxious uh, evil node. Uh, so basically the concept of verification is, is a voting process between uh, the puzzle pieces that you download and uh, the puzzle net itself is intended to have a certain redundancy of, of puzzle pieces uh, so that you can download puzzle piece one from five different servers if you need to um, and compare the results. Uh, if you download, you know, if the, if the file is only uh, five puzzle pieces and you download all five of them and they all agree with each other, uh, then basically you're done. You, you, you just download those five pieces, uh, you stitch them all together, uh, you decrypt the file if it's encrypted. Um, basically the encryption of the file as a whole uh, would be an option for the person injecting it into the puzzle net and, uh, and you have it. Uh, and that kind of gets into the injection and uploading part. Uh, instead of basically serving a file from a server, uh, you have puzzle pieces. And, and just like in Freenet, um, 
when you send data through the network and it gets cached at all the different sites along the way, um, it's basically dispersed uh, between several different servers. And with PuzzleNet, when you inject something into the network, uh, you're basically sending it out to uh, uh, several, um, anywhere between one and, and ten uh, different servers that uh, will have that data redundantly. Um, the, uh, the overall concept with a PuzzleNet server is uh, you dedicate, say, a gigabyte or two gigabytes of space uh, to running this uh, network, and you collect your puzzle pieces uh, that other people are injecting into the network. Um, if the nominal size of a puzzle piece is 32K, uh, two gigabytes goes a long way. Um, do the math. Uh, somebody do the math for me. I, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I think it's a lot. Um, so, you know, you can hold lots of different files. Um, some servers may have uh, only one puzzle piece from a file. Some of them may have five different puzzle pieces from a single file. Um, some files may be broken out into uh, 2,000 puzzle pieces. Some files may be small enough that they're just one small puzzle piece. Um, there's a, basically a lot of flexibility there. Um, and a lot of that is determined when you inject a file into the puzzle net. Uh, as the person injecting the file, you're going to decide basically, um, and the uh, client software that you're using to inject it is probably going to help you, um, but you're going to decide how big the puzzle pieces are going to be, uh, whether you want the entire file encrypted such that you need to get all the pieces together to, encrypt, uh, to decrypt them. Uh, you're going to decide basically uh, what metadata you attach to the file. Um, you can attach a description of the file um, in you know terse terms, uh, keywords and stuff like that, and then basically uh, you let it go and it and it goes out to lots of different servers and gets stored. And if nobody ever downloads downloads it, then it eventually will disappear. Um, but the metadata is basically what ties into the searching again. Um, if I attach certain metadata to the file, um, then that is searchable. Uh, when I send out a query and I get a response back, um, as a human user, I can actually view the metadata and say, uh, now this file isn't what I'm looking for, but this file is. Uh, so if you send out a search for Stego, um, or just Steg, and you get back a steganography program and a stegosaurus picture, uh, you can say, well, I want the steg steganography program. And uh, nobody really knows uh, what you downloaded. Um, general protocol ideas. Um, not really sure why I put that there, but uh, I'll try to expand on it. Um, The basic idea is to borrow from uh, all the good qualities of uh, services like uh, GNUtella and Freenet and Publius. Um, the uh, encryption of the file as a whole uh, so that you need all the pieces in order to decrypt it, um, if you so choose. Um, a lot of times, you know, people upload things that there's really no reason to protect their identity. There's no reason to encrypt it. If it's just an ISO image, um, you know, of a Linux distribution or something like that, uh, there's no reason anyone would need to uh, encrypt that. So you have that option. Um, and <clears throat> uh, hopefully that will basically help uh, disperse this information that's good for the world. Uh, but then, after all these good points of these different other protocols, uh, I looked at some of the drawbacks. Um, I think Freenet is actually a, a really good uh, network, and it's really well thought out. Uh, but I think the difficulties inherent in it are, are kind of difficult to surpass. And so even though uh, PuzzleNet is basically in uh, an infant stage right now, um, the potential exists for you know people to start writing code 
and have a working version before uh, the people writing Puzzle or the people writing Freenet actually uh, can get the search capabilities um, or uh, update capabilities into uh, their protocol. Um, and uh, to go back to the injection for a second, um, since this is kind of a general protocol thing, um, the metadata has certain required fields and certain optional fields. And the optional fields are basically to help uh, humans doing a search so that they can tell, is this the file I want or is this the file I want? Uh, the required fields are basically for verification purposes and uh, to identify the file um, for people who know what they're looking for. Uh, so you can duplicate uh, the functionality of something like Freenet where uh, there is no metadata uh, that makes any sense to a human, uh, but there is a key value that's unique to that file, and if you know that key value, you can get that file. Um, one of the things that is incorporated in the metadata is a version identifier. Um, and if you want to update something, like you put out a new distribution um, of your uh, of your ISO image, uh, you basically mark it as a new version and you put it out there. And depending on what people download, uh, if people download the old version because they like the old version and they know that there's a bug in the new version, the old version is what sticks around and the new version eventually disappears. Uh, on the other hand, if the new version is way, way better and the old version is getting dated, then people download the new version, and they keep downloading the new version until uh, the old version kind of disappears on its own, and the new version is dispersed throughout the network and freely available, and you can download it rapidly from anywhere. Uh, so that's a little bit of, of general ideas. Um, uh, this is a reproduction of one of the pages off of the website um, explaining the different packet types involved in some of these transfers. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. basically just wanted to show that uh, there's like an explanation of each packet type um, and there's basically uh, an overview of uh, how those packet types are used. Um, a lot of the stuff I haven't filled out yet, like um, over on the left-hand side, you'll see at the bottom uh, server behavior and client behavior. Um, I haven't really fully specified uh, all of the server's behavior when it receives different packet types or a client's behavior when it's doing searches and it receives responses back. Uh, but some of that stuff, actually most of that stuff is fairly obvious. Um, for instance, uh, the order of the packets in uh, the search, uh, somebody sends out an initial query and that has basically some search information like um, a regular expression in it. Uh, when a server receives that, uh, basically it's going to distribute it out to all of its neighbors and then it's going to do a search within its database and say, uh, yeah, this matches three of the files that I have, three of the puzzle pieces that I have. And then it'll return a query response uh, that includes data from those three files and then a second query response um, a precise time later that includes the rest of the data um, and I think I mentioned earlier, but basically a query response and a query response to are two separate parts of one piece that's been encrypted so that you need both pieces to decrypt it. Um, and that's one way that uh, a client doing a search can tell whether a search coming back is actually from somebody who uh, has the file or if it was uh, basically intercepted and modified along the way. Um, so just kind of a general look at that. Um, uh, this is a picture of my boss digitally disguised to protect the guilty. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk about other protocols. I've already mentioned quite a few of them. Um, but I wanted to mention um, these five protocols at least uh, because I have a, a fairly decent grasp of um, how they work and what their features are and uh, just kind of want to run through them and um, as 
someone trying to design an anonymous network for sharing files um, describe some of their shortcomings, some of their good properties. Uh, Napster, I'm sure you've heard of. Um, basically, there's a single point of failure with a central agency that maintains the records of what files are available. Um, the drawback to that is when that central point of failure gets sued, it gets shut down. Um, Gnutella is kind of the next step where there's no central authority. Um, and the search capability from PuzzleNet is, is essentially very similar to Gnutella, except for the fact that searches will have to expire after a certain amount of time, uh, like two minutes. Uh, and that's an attempt basically to keep the requests, the search requests, and the responses from flooding the network, because that's a bad thing. Um, so Gnutella suffers from uh, basically a scalability problem where uh, when you have lots and lots of nodes and you're doing lots and lots of searches, uh, those search responses basically flood the network and take up all the bandwidth and then uh, it's really hard to get response back when you wa actually want to download something. Um, can you tell also suffers from uh, a lack of anon anonymity on the server's part. Um, when you're a client, you're doing a search, uh, you're basically protected because nobody can tell uh, except for the person that you're directly connected to and then only probabilistically. Uh, nobody can tell where that search is coming from, but when you receive your responses back, you basically have an IP address and a bunch of file names and you know that that server at that address is providing those files. So uh, somebody like uh, a Metallica lawyer does a GNU search and just takes the list of IP addresses and the list of Metallica songs and goes and files a uh, legal complaint against all those people running those uh, servers. Um, so that's generally a very bad thing. Um, Freenet basically overcomes that really well um, in, in the fact that uh, everything traverses through the network and you're not really sure where the endpoint of the transfer is, uh, so you can't really tell, okay, this is the guy that originated the search and this is the guy that has the file. Uh, all you really know is that somebody over there requested the file and somebody over there has it. Um, Publius is... Uh, fairly new and probably most of you haven't heard of it yet. Uh, it's kind of strange in that uh, the proposal for Publius is for a static array of servers, like a hundred servers. And when you have a static array of servers, basically uh, you're saying, okay, these are the targets. Um, these are the sites that have uh, what people who are looking to download files need. And if you attack these uh, servers, then you can basically cripple the network, you can prevent people from downloading, etc., etc. Um, and also, if you know certain files that are made available, you can say, okay, well, this server has that file, that server has that file, and you can basically shut them down for knowing what they have. Um, to some degree, that's defended in Publius because uh, all the files are encrypted. Um, the servers themselves don't really know what they have. Um, that's kind of the s same thing as, uh, as Freenet and PuzzleNet. Um, the servers aren't really aware of what they have um, unless it's in the metadata for PuzzleNet. With Freenet, basically the servers don't know. Um, <clears throat> So the servers can can basically have uh, plausible deniability on what they have. I, you know, I'm a server, but I don't know uh, that this file I have is illegal, or I don't know that this file violates copyright law or anything like that. Um, one of the interesting things about Publius is uh, the keys for the files are distributed out to these different servers, and uh, even though they're using these static servers. Um, that theoretically you should be able to trust since they're the only servers, um, you can actually still get uh, a form of man in the middle attack where the data that you're transferring from the server gets corrupted, uh, gets replaced with something else, um, or the key value that you need to decrypt it gets replaced with something else. So with Publius, what they've done is uh, they've split the key that's necessary to decrypt the file into several pieces and then each of the servers uh, has a piece of that key. And um, 
one of the things that's covered in uh, the Applied Cryptography book is uh, how to set it up so that you can have, uh, say, 10 different keys for a file and be able to decrypt that file if you have any three of those keys. Um, as an example, numerically speaking, uh, you could split up a key into 100 pieces and still uh, say you only have to have three to decrypt it, or you could split it up into 50 pieces and say you have to have 25 to decrypt it. Uh, at any rate, um, when you have that many servers, chances are one of those is going to have a good copy of the key and a good copy of the file. and if you download enough, and you download enough of those copies, you can tell which one is correct. You can verify that, that the file you're downloading is correct um, using Publius's scheme for uh, sharing the key out. Um, <clears throat> don't think I'll say anything more about Publius for now. Uh, Fling is another fairly new one um, that was announced fairly recently and uh, it's like a totally different concept um, for uh, encrypting traffic uh, using um, an, an onion approach. I don't know if you're familiar with that but basically uh, you set up a certain uh, pathway between nodes and you encrypt each step along the way so that each node along the way only knows where the packet came from and where it's going um, that's you know one hop from it uh, so I encrypt it ten different times with ten different steps uh, indicated send it off to the first uh, note along the way, it decrypts that first step, uh, says, okay, the next step is over here, and uh, sends it over there, and then that second site decrypts that, uh, says, okay, it's supposed to be over here now, decrypts it, sends it over. Uh, so that's the, the basic approach with Fling. And Fling is intended to, um, to basically uh, be a replacement for a generic TCP IP connection um, for FTP, for Telnet, for pretty much anything. Um, so it's more of a generic solution, but it's, but it's basically uh, a networking solution rather than uh, a shared network, uh, connected network. Um, it's not really intended for uh, downloading files or sharing information. It's basically intended just to uh, protect your privacy, which is um, a good thing, but a different purpose, really. Um, I kind of chose Freenet to compare with because it's it's essentially the closest thing uh, in terms of uh, what it's intended for, um, how it works, uh, what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are. Um, searching basically, I've already mentioned um, Freenet. The, uh, the search in Freenet is kind of, at this point, undefined in the software. It, it may be hashed out uh, on the mailing list, and uh, you know it's hard to say uh, whether it'll be available for use in the program anytime soon. Um, downloading, uh, I've already pretty much described PuzzleNet, where you download pieces of the file from lots of different places and then combine them all. And uh, with Freenet, essentially, you send out your search request, and if there's data matching that search request, uh, you get that data back, basically just along the same path that you sent your search out on. Um, you don't really have much control over uh, the download process. If you get a response back to your search, great, you've got your file. Um, you might have to wait a couple of years to actually get the download finished. But um, if you send out your search request and uh, nothing is found, then basically it times out and you don't get anything. Um, pluses and minuses to that. Um, once you get your information, once you get your file, um, you want to decrypt it if it's encrypted. You want to verify it at any rate. Um, 
uh, I've pretty much described the puzzle net approach where um, you have kind of a voting system with your uh, puzzle pieces. Um, if you have agreeing values from three different puzzle pieces, then that's great. That's that's probably an indication that what you've got is, is valid. Uh, if you have disagreeing values, then essentially you can re-download stuff from other places. Um, or you can say, okay, if I have five different copies and three of them agree and the other two are completely different, uh, I'm going to go with the three that agree. Um, so you have a reasonable degree of certainty that uh, you can verify what you've gotten is accurate and what you wanted. Uh, Freenet, uh, actually, uh, I'm not entirely certain. I, I haven't been following the mailing list for quite some time, and uh, I, uh, I don't believe there's really any way to verify um, what you've downloaded. Maybe you can... Next version. Index version? In the next version. Oh, okay. In the next version. Um, yeah, the answer to free net questions is always in the next version. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you have to forgive them based, based on my point of view that I, I, there's actually not even one line of code yet for, for PuzzleNet. So um, it's a race now. But uh, <laughs> uh, injection or dispersal of the file. Um, Essentially, you choose when you inject your file into PuzzleNet, and uh, you send out your little feelers, uh, protocol-wise, to find uh, servers out there that are willing to accept your puzzle piece that have, you know, 4K or 32K or however much available uh, on their hard drive for a puzzle piece. And then uh, you send multiple copies out to different servers, basically for the redundancy value. Um, with Freenet, it's um, it's basically uh, out of your hands. Um, anything that traverses the network gets cached. Uh, if the server that it's traversing has enough hard drive space for what it's sending along, it gets cached at that local server. Uh, if it doesn't have enough hard drive space, then basically it doesn't cache it, and it continues traversing. Um, so essentially, uh, it gets copied, the entire file gets copied along the way when it gets requested and, and then downloaded. Um, so, the uh, the PuzzleNet concept is is basically redundancy, and um, only replicating information that's uh, that's requested enough, basically to justify having multiple copies. Um, I guess that brings up another issue that uh, I kind of meant to mention earlier. Um, I think right now. Maybe you can uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think right now the limit on a free net file is essentially a four byte value for the length, um, unless it's a streaming value or a streaming file. Uh, so essentially you're limited to like a four gigabyte file size for any given file. Uh, with PuzzleNet, since you're breaking it up into many puzzle pieces, um, the limit of a puzzle piece size is four gigabytes. Um, hopefully there won't be any that that large out there, but you never really know. Uh, maybe someday when we all have uh, T3 connections into our homes, uh, a four gigabyte puzzle piece size won't be a big deal. Um, but the limit for a puzzle piece is four gigabytes. There is actually no limit. Uh, well, I guess there is. Um, have to remember now. Uh, there is um, an identifier in the metadata for a puzzle piece that indicates the puzzle piece number. So um, essentially, I, I think I have that as a two byte value, which gives you um, an upper limit of 65,000 uh, puzzle pieces for a file. Um, so if your file is really huge, um, it could be up to, uh, I don't even know the term for something beyond terabytes, but uh, it could be pretty darn huge. <laughs> uh, what'd you say? Exabytes. Exabytes? Okay. Uh, whatever. Uh, anyway, really, really big. Um, and it's it's always possible that I might 
you know change sometime in the future and have the uh, uh, the puzzle piece ID be four bytes and then it would be you know four billion times four billion would be your maximum file size at any rate it's pretty darn huge so you know you could start like sharing DVDs and downloading DVDs now um, <clears throat> That kind of gets into some of the features and capabilities a little bit. I, I sort of separated that because um, it's it's more of, of an abstract discussion than uh, the specifics of how things work. Um, Freenet is pretty cool. Um, I uh, I kind of said to the last guy as I came up here that uh, that I was going to make fun of Freenet, but really I think Freenet is, is a pretty good project and um, I know I probably won't have time to contribute to it, uh, but at some point when they have a, a server that's ready to run, um, I may run one at, at my site. Um, so I, I don't have anything really against Freenet except for a couple of the capabilities that I think PuzzleNet uh, does better. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool about Freenet is they, they basically are open-ended. Uh, there's the possibility of supporting streaming media. Um, I, I'm not really sure how uh, that could be handled in Puzzle, and I don't think uh, it's really a big concern, but um, it's one of the things that, uh, that kind of makes Freenet a really cool thing. Um, I'll move on. Uh, actually, I probably need to wrap up pretty soon uh, so I can catch my flight, but um, I was looking basically at um, different attacks that you can launch against uh, an anonymous network. Um, no matter how you work out your, your arrangements for your network, uh, there's going to be attacks against it. Um, nothing is foolproof. Uh, so basically, uh, you have denial of service attacks, uh, you have, you know, attacks that uh, lead you to doubt the data that you're downloading or, uh, in, you know, that are intended to uh, flood the system with uh, bogus stuff that prevents people from uh, from downloading stuff that they want. Um, one of the attacks against Napster that somebody launched was to upload a bunch of bogus MP3 files. Um, I don't know whether it was like Britney Spears or NSYNC or whatever, but uh, you know they uploaded a bunch of files and then people downloaded them and found that that they were just some you know cow honking noise or something. Uh, um, one of the things that uh, that is really difficult to um, design for is uh, a broad range of attacks because it's it's far easier to figure out a way of attacking something uh, than to figure out a, a good way to defend against all the attacks. Uh, man in the middle basically is uh, someone malicious um, trying to figure out what data you're transferring on the network or corrupt the data that you're transferring on the network. Uh, the uh, search mechanism in PuzzleNet is intended to thwart the man-in-the-middle attack uh, to some degree um, uh, as, as the Freenet uh, person mentioned. Uh, there's basically a Diffie-Hellman key exchange and at this point in time uh, a man-in-the-middle attack against a malicious attacker isn't really uh, defended against. So. Um, that's a difficult thing to handle. Um, anytime you have an anonymous network, basically, you know, you don't know anybody you're talking to, and you don't know anybody that has any of the data, and you don't know anybody that's downloading anything from you. So how do you know who you can trust? And essentially, you can't, you can't figure out who you can trust uh, unless you can identify uh, the other nodes with some sort of uh, signature, digital signature, in which case it's no longer anonymous. So uh, that's always going to be a difficult thing. Um, essentially, uh, you know, you defend against what you can, and what you can't defend against, uh, you cover up. Uh, flooding attacks basically is, is someone uploading a bunch of stuff to try to take up space on the servers, uh, to try to prevent other um, other network traffic from occurring. Um, 
<clears throat> and a, a black hole type attack would be someone who uh, accepts, say, a server that accepts puzzle pieces uh, from people that are trying to upload puzzle pieces, somebody trying to inject files in the network, uh, but then basically just discards the data, or accepts search requests, um, but doesn't forward them on and doesn't respond to them. Uh, so that's kind of like a single server node um, that's being evil. And uh, hopefully the redundancy in the network um, helps defend against that. And the, uh, the fact that uh, the fact that there are many different pieces of the files spread throughout the network and many different servers containing each, each piece uh, will hopefully prevent uh, a black hole type attack from succeeding. Um, essentially, um, one of the things that you try to do with the different, different attacks like this is figure out whether someone is actually attacking you and who is doing the attack if, if you figure out that there's an attack going on. And it's a difficult proposition. Um, if you're a server and you're you know, passing network traffic, passing puzzle net packet traffic uh, between yourself and other servers, and you notice another server that's not responding to any of your requests, or uh, responding to every injection request with, yeah, I've got room, yeah, I've got room, uh, then you start getting suspicious. And um, I haven't really defined any uh, expected response to these different detections. Um, and I haven't defined any thresholds uh, for these detections. But um, you know, at some point, um, it'll probably become an issue. Uh, it's, it's hard to say um, with uh, no code that you can run and, uh, and not a whole lot of, um, of the protocol completely defined as far as expected behavior on the server and client's part. Uh, it's hard to say you know, how you should respond to uh, detecting this sort of attack. Uh, I get basically from from analyzing the protocol and from analyzing uh, the way it's intended to work, just thought-wise, um, I get the impression that a black hole attack uh, would be detectable. And uh, essentially, because of the redundancy in the system, uh, if a node is evil and you detect that node is evil, uh, you can basically just disconnect from that node. Uh, which is kind of another network concept uh, that's different between PuzzleNet and FreeNet. Um, on the PuzzleNet network, basically, you have a dynamic set of connections. And uh, servers would disconnect from other servers and form other connections to other servers uh, periodically. So um, uh, the network kind of moves itself along uh, in sort of a random fashion. And uh, one of the potentials for uh, dealing with attacks like this is if you can determine um, that a node is suspicious, you can put it on a blacklist. Uh, you can share blacklists with other nodes um, and basically come to a consensus that, yeah, we think this node is bad, so we're not going to allow connections anymore. Uh, that's sort of a future prospect. and. Uh, um, a feature that's uh, not really fully examined yet. Um, and just a brief word on the TTL equals zero. If uh, this is a different form of attack than, than what I mentioned so far, basically like uh, uh, denial of service and uh, corruption of data and things like that. Well, uh, the TTL equals zero attack is basically intended to uh, determine uh, who's sharing what files and who's requesting what files. Uh, if you send out a bunch of packets with a TTL equals zero um, to all your neighbors, uh, PuzzleNet doesn't have the, uh, the probabilistic uh, decay of, of packets the way uh, FreeNet 
and I don't I don't know if any others use it, but but Freenet uses like a probabilistic uh, decay of packets instead of a a straight uh, decrement TTL, and if it's zero, then you're the last node. Uh, so anyway, uh, with PuzzleNet, if you send out packets with the TTL equals zero, then any response you get back is guaranteed to be from uh, that node that you sent the request to. Um, so. An evil node, uh, like a, a spy node that's operated by the CIA or something, can send out a bunch of TTL equals zero requests and see who gets uh, stuff back and look at the responses that it gets back. Um, it's another thing that, that could probably be, be detected. Um, it's it's uh, kind of difficult to say, but uh, there are a lot of potential weaknesses in in any sort of network and uh, as the uh, as the mailing list on on freenet attests uh, there's a lot of debate that goes into deciding whether or not something is secure against different attacks um, here's some links uh, to the different um, sites for the different uh, protocols um, no particular order uh, <clears throat> I uh, I'm not really gonna like promote anything above anything else. Uh, I'll say Freenet is a good one. Um, hopefully you'll check out PuzzleNet. Uh, I mentioned Yoink at the end, but 